Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for another episode of So Chatty. And it is episode number 57 for April 29th, 2022. And today we're going to talk about technology and some other things. But before we get into it, an announcement. Craft and Chat, which is my monthly get together where we just work on whatever we're working on, whether it's an art project, uh, art journaling, scrapbooking, sewing, quilting, knitting, crocheting, whatever, organizing your underwear drawer alphabetically. It's up to you, but it's just a time for us to get together. So that will be this coming Wednesday, which is May the 4th, May 4th be with you. And uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the link for it is in the Zoom uh not in the zoom the zoom link is in the show notes below and uh, i have already sent an email to those of you that are on the mailing list for it as well so you should have gotten your own personal copy of the zoom link as well so that's this coming wednesday may the 4th okay and just a, a note here um lately i've been getting a few comments uh underneath uh my videos my interview videos and which is great but some of you are making comments as if the person that I have interviewed is going to see your comment. In other words, you have written a personal message or a message directed to that individual. They probably aren't going to see the message, okay? I think some people are confused that when I do these interviews and these people, some of them have YouTube channels of their own, that when you write a comment below the interview, it is going to their YouTube channel comments. It's not. It's on my channel and I'm sorry but I'm not going to take the time and take your comment and cut and paste it and onto their YouTube channel if you really wish to reach out to them and talk to them then you need to go to their YouTube channel and their YouTube channel is always in the show notes below the interview you just click on that link it'll take it you to them and then in their comment section you can write whatever it is that you want to write okay so I think there's some confusion there for some people as to how that works so I want to clear that up for you okay so what's that take me to now okay Kawartha quilting which I did a review on last week and you've heard me talk about them before they are my source for all things AccuQuilt these days and um we were in picking up some more Hacu quilt uh, this earlier this week. And while I was in there, I saw that they had a kit. And I'm going to show this kit on the Idiot Quilter next Tuesday. But it's uh, one that's come out this year for the 10th anniversary of the Northcott line of O Canada fabrics. And it's sort of a sampler quilt. And I really like it. But I've hesitated purchasing it, the pattern for it, because right now getting the fabric is almost next to impossible ultimate sewing is out of most of it and they're not sure when it's going to come in again northcott has not been very cooperative for one reason or another uh getting this fabric out to their dealers um so basically i thought well if i can't get the fabric and that's basically what this pattern is all about is the fabric i i wasn't going to do it but when i was in kawartha quilting lo and behold they had a kit with the fabric in it already cut into the chunks that you need um ready to go so i purchased the kit i think it was about 160 dollars before tax which i don't think is out of the way uh for a kit that has the fabric and everything with it when i got it home and opened it up they had marked all the fabric with a sticky note telling you which fabric goes where it matches up with the pattern which is something I have never, ever gotten in a kit before that I have bought. There may be kits out there where they do it, but because Kawartha Quilting themselves put the kit together, I thought that was really a nice touch. Because when you're doing a kit, sometimes getting the right fabrics in the right spot is not all that easy because some fabrics look very much the same. And depending on how clear the diagram is or the picture of the actual fabric in the pattern is, it can be very confusing and so you spend a lot of time trying to figure out which pa which fabric they're using for a certain section but they've taken the guesswork out they've put a little sticky note with the letter of the fabric that corresponds to the pattern right there for you so i thought that shows that they really do put a little extra effort into whatever they do for their customers as well because most places just cut up the fabric not always accurately and throw it in a bag with the pattern say here's your kit 
Um, so they went a little bit further. So another reason why Kawartha Quilting is becoming one of my favorite stores. In fact, to be honest, Kawartha Quilting is right up there with Ultimate Sewing now. Um, their their store is actually very well laid out and really nice inside yeah. too. They have a good selection of fabric in there, and as I said, it's a, my go to for Accu Quilt dies and things like that. Uh, price wise, they're a little bit more expensive for their fabric. You bought fabric the other day, what yeah. Was it I think it's about twenty twenty one dollars a meter, so it's as, a little pricey as compared to Shirley's, which are fifteen to seventeen dollars. She still has the best prices anywhere. However, the fabric I got was something I don't don't think that ultimate sewing is carrying yeah and actually they don't have a lot of the same stuff as ultimate sewing there's a few things that are the same but they carry other lines they too. carry other lines they carry some unique lines like yeah. uh, i bought some uh, fabric from them last time that i found out was actually a japanese fabric mm. yeah so now that is not to undercut my love of ultimate sewing because my heart still is in ultimate sewing always will be but there's room enough in my heart for Kawartha quilting as well uh, with that. So Well, they obviously sell a specialty product that Ultimate doesn't yeah. carry, so, which is the AccuQuilt. So. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily run up there. They're 30 minutes north of us. I wouldn't necessarily run up there just to buy fabric unless they were showing something that I know I could not get at Ultimate Sewing. Then, yes, I might. But... I'm still going to go to Ultimate Sewing. For uh, my they also carry a large selection of wide back fabrics. Yeah, um, right now Ultimate Sewings, I think, is having some trouble getting some wide backs in. They they don't really have uh, a great selection at this moment in time, but I'm sure that Shirley is working on that. Um, there are still some problems with you know getting supplies uh, to the quilt stores. You hear this from all of them. Even Quartha uh, Quilting has told me that. The supply chain, uh, because of COVID and other things that are going on in the world, is really causing them a lot of anguish right now. So we just have to be patient, I guess, for it. I guess my advice, though, for you is this. You walk into a quilt store and you see a fabric you really love and you're hemming and hawing whether you should buy it, I would say buy it because you may not be able to get it again. And that is why I bought this kit. Because and also buy uh, a little, probably a little more than what you think you need because yeah. uh, a lot of times people buy don't buy enough and then when they go back, they can't find it again. I mean, I know fabric is expensive, but I have watched people get, I just need 1.6 meters. Well, for the difference in the price you're going to pay for 1.6 meters as opposed to 2 meters, I would go with the 2 meters because what if you make a mistake? And we've said this before. But there are those who are very, very, you know, cautious about what they spend on their fabric. And I get it. I mean, money doesn't grow on trees. Neither does fabric. Some fabric does. But, um, you know, yeah, so whatever. But, yeah, right now there are some supply um, problems with everything. So, anyways, I just want to, to let you know about Kawartha Quilting and how, you know, they did this. I, I mean, that just is a reflection of how they go just a step beyond uh, for their customers in there. So, okay. So, Walter's next week going to be busy. He will not be joining us for craft and chat because he's going to, how many days is it? It's a three-day course um, from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then you're taking another and one on Saturday. And then I'm taking a different one on Saturday. So, And what is this class all about and who's it with? Well, it's with Ron Collins, and he's a um, sewing um, specialist, guru, whatever you want to call him. That's a Canadian guy. He lives in a small town north of us. Uh, in, in, uh... So this is a picture of Ron Collins that I've put up here. Now you said he, where, where does he live? Yeah, he lives in uh, uh, a, a small city in northern Saskatchewan called Saskatoon. And um, he's uh, pretty much born and raised in that location, and he still lives there. And he travels all around Canada and teaches people how to uh, sewing techniques, uh, particularly with, with both men's and women's clothing, how to size your patterns, how to uh, do sewing techniques, different kinds of sewing techniques to make it easier um, to put a garment together. 
and um, he, the focus was either on men's or women's patterns. He also has developed a whole line of patterns for Vogue uh, uh, and uh, mostly men's clothing. And so uh, he uh, uh, is very knowledgeable. He's a very personable guy and he uh, will help you out with whatever pattern you're working on to uh, do it. And the pattern I'm using for next week is one of his patterns for a uh, bomber jacket. So um, so it's not this pattern I'm showing on the screen right no, now. No, no, it's not this pattern, but it's a different pattern for a bomber jacket. So uh, I'm gathering all the pro things together that I need for this class. So um, I am uh, going to have a, sort of a sample uh, sizing with me that I can uh, start off with and then uh, and then go from there. So this course you're taking is four days yes it's uh, no no it's yeah it's four days there's three days of the uh sizing and uh sewing of the bomber jacket and one day is a separate class for working with knitted uh, fabric no oh, okay so how much were these classes then uh altogether uh they were uh um 560 dollars for uh for the for uh, both classes. Well, that's pretty. Well, I guess you're getting five. I'm getting four days. Four day, four yeah, whole four days. days. So really, that's it's not bad. That's just like a hundred and ten dollars or so a day, kind of a deal. Yeah. So really, I guess that's not out of the way. Anymore. I mean, they're full classes. They're all day, like from nine to four. And he um, is a personality of sorts. Yeah, and, and apparently there's only going to be a five people in the class. So. Oh, that's it. Yeah. So, wow, so you should get lots of personal attention. Right. So I'm assuming it was Brendan. Uh, who Brendan, the guy that teaches my classes for shirts and that, he uh, organized this uh, this event. So, Well, that sounds exciting, but it's going to make me very lonely next week. I'll be home all by my lonesome. I may have to uh, have pop-up sew days or something. Who knows? Maybe. Well. Maybe not. I'll probably be busy with the Quilt Path. And that's what I want to turn our attention to next. You know, the Quilt Path is the software that I bought for my long arm for Lucy. And I'm learning it. And last week, I think I talked about doing an edge-to-edge -edge design on a couple of quilts. And that worked out okay. I had some little problems, but I, I've since learned from my mistakes. And basically, that's how you have to learn Quilt Path. You just have to play with it and, you know, don't get too uptight when you make a mistake, like do it on something you don't care about to start with, which is what I've been doing the last couple of days. I have a scrap quilt that I made, I don't know how long ago. It's been sitting in my UFO pile for probably a couple of years. I, may, I think I may have put it together before pre-COVID sort of thing. So um, it was one of those things, you know, you got a pile of scraps, you don't feel like concentrating on a pattern, but you feel like sewing something. So you just throw them together and uh, cut them into squares and put them together and you got a sort of a quilt. So I did that. And this one was working out really well for the fact that it was made up of blocks. And I want to do some customizable quilting, meaning, you know, how do I pick a pattern, put it in one block, pick a different pattern, put it in another block, and that kind of thing. It also was giving me an opportunity to see how the different blocks that came with the program work. So I was doing that. Well, I learned a, few, one, a couple of things. One of the things I learned is, first of all, if you're going to do that kind of quilting as opposed to edge to edge, make sure that your blocks are straight and square. Because when you try to line it up, um, when you place it, uh, your, your pattern onto the block, if it isn't square, there isn't a lot you can do about it. You can do a little bit of an adjustment to make it fit in there. But if you're way out, if it's real wacky, and this quilt was really wacky, um, you're going to have some problems, especially in sashing and in border pieces as well. I found, uh, there wasn't as much room to play around with the positioning in those because they're smaller but anyways i did this went through it all uh oh and also make sure your quilt is on your long arm straight now i have a tendency to when i put tracy showed me when we first when i first used a long arm at her store way back she showed you how to put your quilt layered onto the long arm 
and you were to, supposed to she said you take you put your channel lock on your horizontal channel lock and you drag the arm across the top of your quilt and as you're doing that you either pull the edges of your quilt up or pull or pull them pull them down a little bit so that they're even you find a spot on your needle that's going over the top that's approximately uh she does it about an eighth of an inch eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch so try and get the quilt before you do any sewing on it straight along that top part then you go and you baste it uh, across there as well well yeah i thought well does that really matter because yeah it does it does because i've gotten lazy and i kind of well it's close enough i kind of pull the arm across and fluff it down here if it's something's way out i'll pull it down a little bit well it's close enough because my theory is this and it is wrong i'm going to trim the quilt so where you see that basting line going across it's going to be cut off anyways i'll be squaring the quilt up and yeah the quilt will come out square doing that but what doesn't come out square are your individual blocks because you you should have to have those all squared up before you put them into the quilt to start with and i usually do that yeah, but so that line knocks it out of line that yeah. line will knock it and out it of. gets worse all the way down that's exactly it and that's the problem i was having the first row of the blocks on this scrap quilt that i did were pretty good they're pretty close by the time i got to the last row they're a little wonky like kind of a thing now the thing is that's not so bad in this quilt because it is scrappy the blocks are already wonky in the way they've been pieced and everything so you don't really notice it but where you do notice it is when you're trying to put in the sashing uh the, the pattern in the sashings because my sashings were out a little bit and so and the bottom one would have been out a lot oh the bottom one was, was giving me complete hell to the point where i just went well such is life it's a scrappy quilt <laughs> for sure definitely but i'm glad i did it because i learned something from it now i have another quilt in my ufo pile out there actually i only have one ufo that hasn't been finished yet and this is the one i call cock block it's got a big rooster in the middle of it that was paper pieced and then it's basically colored blocks all the way around it lots of opportunity to do customized quilting in each of the blocks it will be a little bit of a challenge because now i have to go into i have to explore things like triangulations where they you place like things but i think i know how to do that and um this one i'll make sure it is on there straight as well so stay tuned i'll let you know now i did do a video of working on the scrap quilt and i haven't put it up yet but it'll probably go up either later today or it'll go up uh, sometime tomorrow uh so watch for that um, yeah, I just explain to you and show you what I've been talking about here. So, yeah, it's lots of fun with the quote path. Do I regret buying it? No. No, I do not. I do not. And once I've gotten over the learning curve a little bit more, um, it'll be even better. I'm pretty sure of that. So, yeah. So, another piece of technology, and we're leading up to our little discussion about technology here, is, of course, my AccuQuilt. So, guess what? I just picked up this afternoon the 9-inch and the 4-inch block, or cube. I now have all the cubes. Someone said to me the other day, or wrote a comment going, so, now you need to get the companion uh, ones that go with it. Yes, I know. Now, I'm not going to run right out tomorrow and buy those, because they're expensive, too. Everything AccuQuilt is expensive. Um, but I'm really loving it. And to give you an example of how I've been using it lately, after I finish a quilt, um, before I take it off the long arm, and this is my technique, and I'm sure there are people out there going, oh my God, you don't do that, do you really? Yes, I do, and it works for me. You know, when you take a quilt off, you have a lot of extra backing and a lot of extra batting on all sides of your quilt, because you have to have that to anchor it when you put it on the long arm. So then you got to cut all that off and square up your quilt. Well, you need, you know, nobody has a table big enough to handle a, a whole side, a whole quilt, a large quilt. So you're cutting in chunks, right? You're, and this stuff is all over the place. And I 
have it hanging over my embroidery machine and over on the other end and whatnot. So what I do is, as I'm unwinding the quilt from Lucy, I cut off the backing and the backing, rough cut it, about an inch away from the edge of the quilt. And just as I'm pulling the quilt through, I go up on either side and then I get to the top before I unleash it from the red snappers that hold it onto the leaders. I just cut across. So what that does is it now makes it a little bit more manageable on my cutting table so that I can cut off. I'm not cutting off pieces this big in the camera this big. I'm cutting off pieces this big and I can square it up. It's easier to square up too. I find that's my method. I don't know if anybody else does it that way. I'm sure there are some people out there, purists, who go, oh my God, you can't do that. Yes, you can. And I have, and I will continue to do so because it works for me. But then I have the cutoffs, right? From all of this, I pull the backing or the batting off of those because usually you've got a little bit of batting stitched to these pieces. These pieces are can be about this wide or sometimes a little wider and they're long. I throw them on the Accu quilt. I fan fold them onto one of my strip, my two and a half inch strip die, run it through the Accu quilt. It cuts me three long strips out of a piece if it's as, as, if it's enough to cover the entire die of binding in like that. And if I'm not going to use that for binding or for something else, I just cut more strips at different sizes from it. It takes only minutes to do it. And now you've got strips for sashing, borders, whatever you want. I didn't have to straighten up the fabric, uh, you know, and then get out my big rulers and, and figure it out. I just throw it on onto the die, run it through, bingo, got it fast, Bob's your uncle, it's done. So that in itself impresses me. But there are still a lot of other things that'll happen and if you saw my video this week about using the accu quilt i did one of their designs for a star using it and if i was making a lot of those stars it would have been a heck of a lot faster because i wouldn't have to cut keep cutting cutting is the longest part of quilting i think it's doing the bloody cutting um and getting it accurate accu quilt was great for that so yeah so will there be more accu quilt pieces in my future oh yeah Probably. Yep. I just bought the um, Drunkard's Path die for a project that's coming up with the Quilter's Way in another month. So I'm getting prepared for that. And it was on sale. So even better. And that's when to buy the Accu Quilt stuff too. Wait for sale because they're pricey. They are pricey. Okay. So that takes us to the whole idea here. This is technology. Quilt path is technology. The long arm is technology. Um, our sewing machines are technology. Our embroidery machines are technology. Our sergers are technology. Accu quilt is technology. And there are those out there that are purists. And they say, well, there's three types of people, I think. There's the purists. The purists go, no, you should do it in the more traditional way before you start branching off into using technology and letting machines do it all for you, because that's taking the art out of quilt making. You know, people made quilts for hundreds of years without technology. That's not true. That's not true. But they were making it without technology. A needle. A needle is technology. Okay. That is a form of technology. Because think about it. How long have needles been in our society. I don't know when they were invented. Hundreds of years. But um, the Aboriginal people did not use metal needles at first. They sewed with very finely carved down sharp sticks and nature's needles they used. They'd find certain plants that had very stiff like thorns or long thorns or even pine needles, I've heard of that. And they use that to sew things together. So metal needles are a form of technology. So the purists are wrong about that. And if you use, well, you said, if you're using your decorative stitches. Yeah, well, I mean, any kind of sewing. Uh, well, I mean, even if you go into sewing, uh, when the first treadle machines came out, that's a form of technology yeah. too. It automated you to sew. Um, 
even though it's a, you know just a plain old straight stitch or whatever yeah. it and it wasn't sewing, powered it was yeah. electric you were the power like, i mean my mom's i stopped my mom's sewing machine upstairs that's uh, a hand crank yeah so i mean it's still a sewing machine so so now you've got powered sewing machines so so the purists out there that think you're cheating because you are taking advantage of the technology to make your life a little easier maybe to sew something a little faster maybe a little bit more accurately um using your machine to do your embroidery either with decorative stitches or an actual embroidery machine instead of doing hand embroidery i don't know those purists i think are 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 cheating themselves out of you know bringing the art form into the 21st century i mean there's a lot of people that are um quilters that uh have produced art quilts but they still used sewing machines and technology yeah, and iron. irons it and was just their mind there had changed the uh may they may not have followed a precise pattern they may have had something in their head that they yeah. they've created so but that's it's not part to of say, the artistic process yeah and it's that's what i was going to say it's not to say though that people who would rather or who enjoy hand sewing or hand embroidery that we should poo them no because that's an art form that is a skill uh, a really fine skill that i know i would never ever be able to do because i won't dedicate the time that it takes to learn something like that i mean my grandmother sewed a quilt and i've shown this before back and most of that quilt was hand sewn the quilting in it was definitely hand sewn she had a frame that she put it on which is the way they used to quilt and people do do that now they enjoy it they find it relaxing um to me i would find it painful because i would be sticking needles into me all the time and bleeding all over the quilt but you know there's nothing i have nothing against that at all but i have what i have against are people who thumb the technology and say well you're no longer creating art because art is done by by hand well no it's still being done by hand it's just that you are supplementing your hands with the technology that's available uh with it but then there's the other extreme and i'm probably closer to that if i can use technology to create something for me then i will that's why i have the quilt path for the long arm that's why i've got an accu quilt that's why i have an embroidery machine as opposed to hand embroidery all those kind of things I love machines and I feel that in the 21st century if we have the technology we should be using it because that that's why it was created in the first place to be used there are still decisions you have to make when you use all of these things you have to pick your fabric you have to pick your design you have to um, decide what's going to look good on your quilt there's still you have to do a little bit of finessing with some of this well, not only that there's still a lot of people that do their quilt tops by uh you know machine piecing and making mm-hmm. a quilt top but then they send it out to the long armor to have it yeah. long so because they like, don't I mean, want to quilt it and a lot of the long armors are using things like quilt path to 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 uh to uh quilt their quilts so they're they're actually another extreme they haven't even even done their own quilting no. using a machine now i mean i understand that you know not everybody has a room for a, a long arm nor the funds to buy one so um and some people just don't like doing that part of it yeah they don't like quilting it i have to admit i'm one of those kind of people i don't really i enjoy piecing more than i do quilting however i may be changing over now that i'm using the quilt path because that fascinates me but you know now i would not send one of my quilts out to have somebody else uh do it if i if i didn't have the lucy that was never thought for me because i have a bit of this attitude that if i'm creating it i create it from beginning to end because it's not mine alone then if i sent my quilt out to have someone else quilt it it's no longer just my creation i have a co-creator um with that but it's not to say that if you for instance put um your quilt in a show not necessarily that you would but if you did you'd still say that you know uh, the quilting was done using a long well it's, quilt it's only ethical that you would yeah, have you would have, have to, to get credit that, for that right so yeah you don't try to pass that off as being done by you alone and yes and, and i think they uh, in quilt shows and that you are they have an actual category for machine quilting 
uh, with it as well. And they have one for uh, usually for hand quilted as too. So, you know, it's both worlds that are um, considered. But there is another group. Okay, so we got the purists. We've got the high techers. Then we got the ones in the middle who want to create their quilt or do their sewing. And they would like to use the benefits of the technology, but the technology scares them. And I have heard so many tales where people buy, like especially embroidery machines, they will say, well, I've had this for two years. I've never taken it out of the box because I'm afraid I don't know how to use it. I'm scared. I'm afraid I'll break something if I use I, it. I've heard that from people that had sergers. Um, Even certain sewing and, machines. You know, like overlock machines. And, well, I, I kind of thought I needed one of these, but I don't really know how to use it. Yeah. So, uh, so it just sat in the box for years on end. Um, there was a lady in one of my embroidery classes. She had bought, purchased a... a a um, sewing machine at one point in time which was uh, a combination sewing and embroidery machine and she sold on her machine for years and years and years but never ever used the embroidery section of it so and was in the embroidery class because she wanted to learn how to do it well in the meantime the embroidery unit had seized up on her because and means. it had to be reconditioned for it to be work working and so. that's just a waste of money yeah right there because embroidery machines are not Cheap. And a combination embroidery uh, sewing machines are not usually that cheap. No, either. look at the new M17. You're, you're paying a lot for that extra embroidery uh, feature that you don't end up using. Yeah. And I think last week when we talked about the M17 and I said 22000 that was American. I just found out from Shirley at Ultimate Sewing, she's getting some in $26,000. That's for the suggested retail That's the price. suggested retail. I know that Shirley will give a better price than that on it. I'm not buying one, okay? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think... I always thought the fifteen thousand was quite an expensive machine, and it was, and it was. But uh, this it was this, ten thousand dollars less. Really, really, really over the top. Yeah. Um. I even if I had the uh, the money, I really wouldn't think I'd consider one of those machines at that price. Talking about using technology, I want it to piece my quilt, layer my quilt, quilt my quilt, and bind my quilt. And why at a push of a button? So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many, how how high big a seller this machine will be. But then again, there's lots of people out there with lots of money and who, that's their thing. So whatever. They're also pushing this um, uh, M17 that you can do uh, quilting via by hoop in by the hoop, hoop which yeah. you've tried that, yeah. and for some people it's. There are some May people work. I know that have had good success with that. I'm not one of them. I've done videos about it. You can look in my back, back catalog of videos. You'll find uh, what I did. I made it work, but I didn't enjoy the process. So um, anyways, uh, oh, that's interesting. Uh, this this computer just talks to itself anymore. Never mind. Um, so yeah, people who just leave them in the box or... They're constantly, and I belong to an online group now for Quilt Path. And some people are are completely, well, and I know why, because we didn't get any documentation with it as to how to really use it. Uh, and there's a lot of things to learn with it. But they're afraid to play with it. They're afraid they're going to break something. And I don't think you will. It's like people, when they first got a computer, they didn't want to hit... and press any buttons because they were afraid if they didn't know what it was going to do that it would blow up the world or something um no you got to play with it and that's what i'm doing right now with the quilt path but that's part of the the charm to me i like playing with the technology i like seeing okay what if that sometimes gets me into trouble but doesn't usually break the machine okay it just breaks my heart when it doesn't do what I thought it should do or whatever. Um, but yeah, th so those people in the middle ground who are a little bit afraid of the technology, but at the same time, they don't want to resort back to doing it the old fashioned way, for lack of a better term, or the more classical way. That's probably a better way to put it, the classical way of doing things. So yeah, so I have heard people say, oh, well, you quilted that 
using a computerized system. Well, that's cheating. No, it is not. It is not cheating. It is making best use of technology for your purposes. You are the creator. You are the maker. You make the decisions. If you decide you want to go the technological route, because that fits your aesthetic, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to do it by hand because you enjoy that process, there's nothing wrong with that either. But don't be a snob about people who want to use technology in their creations. I mean, we use technology every day. Look at the best chefs in the world. Where would they be if they had to cook whatever they're creating on an open fire? They're using technology. Um. Yeah, like there isn't too much these days. We use it uh, that uh, uh, doesn't use technology. Yeah. Is using a calculator cheating when you're doing a math problem? Like, I mean, look, using a toilet is technology. Because think about it. If we didn't have those, where would we be doing our business? Hmm. Yeah. Can you say outhouse, dirty hole? Yeah. Okay. So these are things that people who go around and say, oh, you're cheating. Yeah, you just want to put their head underneath the I table. guess you maybe look at it as modern quilting. Well, it is. That's the way I look at it. It's, it's quilting in the 21st century and sewing in the 21st century. I mean, yeah, it's called progress. You know, everything is technology. So anyways, that's just what I want to talk about today because I know that a lot of people who watch these videos and they know I, I love my toys. And yes, and I don't make any bones about it and I don't make any excuses and, and I do not apologize for it. I am a technophile. We both are. We love our toys. They can be maddening at times, but persevere you can still beat a machine, okay? Machines still aren't smarter than we are. Yeah, that might be next month, though. AI. Who knows what that. quilting will look like in 10 years? They may have some replacement for a long arm. Who knows? They'll have a quilting machine. You throw in your fabric. You punch in the, the pattern in the computer. It little conveyor belt chops up all your pieces for you, sews them all together. At the end of the thing, it all comes out as one quilt. Yeah. And don't think that that's very, that far-fetched. Because think about, they have 3D printers now that have a conveyor belt on them. So that it prints parts and moves on to the next one and the next one. So if you're into mass production on the home level, I mean, I'm not buying one because there's a lot of problems with them. But it's just around the corner. It really is. All this stuff is. Or you get a robot to do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> or hire midgets. Right now, I think midgets are the way to go. Okay, that's not politically correct. Hire little people. Little people. Why little people? Because you can stack them up when you're done with them in a closet. Okay, I'm going to get into trouble for that comment. I know I am. So save it. I know I'm not being politically correct. It was a joke at the expense of people who are little people. Little people are people too. Okay, I know that. I'm just trying to be funny. Leave me alone. Go away. <laughs> I'll ignore your comment. Okay. So we're rambling now. All right. So that's uh, it for us today on So Chatty. As always, if you have some suggestions for us to look into for So Chatty, don't be afraid to drop them into the show notes in the comment section uh, below. Uh, and we will definitely consider them uh, with that. And that's where we get some of our best ideas. Why is everything going off around me? I'm covered with too much technology. Oh, there's a new episode of Outer Range. Oh, quick. We have to go watch that. Okay. So hope you have a good time. Don't uh, good week. Don't forget about craft and chat. If you're able to join us and hint, there may be a pop-up sewing day on May the 7th. Maybe, maybe we'll see. So have a good one. Say goodbye, Walter. Goodbye. Bye y'all. Bye y'all. Bye y'all.